here today for the fourth in this series. The series of convocations based on the idea that you need to learn a great deal about the college and learn it as quickly as possible if you're going to make the best academic adjustment that you can. We've tried to bring before you the curricular advisors to tell you about the problems of getting the courses you want and the classes you want. We brought a representative number of faculty members before you to give you some notion of what to expect in the classes you have. Last week, the student personnel service services were presented to help you understand some of the complement services that are offered by the college, college to make sure that you get your money's worth when you come to college. Our presentation today has to do, deal with a fourth component, and we think a very important one. Somewhere in your readings, there's a point made that the real test of a college education is whether or not the student learns to learn. I can think of no better place than the library to look to see if a student is really learning to learn on his own. It is there that the student shows whether or not he understands what's been asked of him in the way of assignments. It is in the library where he shows whether or not he's beginning to discriminate uh, for himself on choices that are offered by his instructor relative to reading. It is in the library where a student shows that he's willing to do some things that might be looked upon as above and beyond the call of duty. For that reason, we had this convocation and a panel of students and faculty and librarians to deal with some questions that we think important in this understanding. Before uh, turning these questions to the panel, however, I'd like to introduce the librarian of the college. Dr. Grady uh, has been librarian here probably longer than she wants me to tell you. She uh, comes to Ball State from a fine academic background of training at Florida State University, at George Peabody College for Teachers, and holds her doctorate from the University of Chicago. She's head of the Department of Library Science, is the college librarian, and she's going to make a few remarks about the way she views the role of the library in the life of students. Dr. Grady. Thank you, Dean Lowhead. Ladies and gentlemen of the class of 68, I presume. Hope there'll be a few more of you there. I'm presuming two things. One, that you are ladies and gentlemen. And two, that all or most of you will be in the graduating class of June 1968. Now, June 1968 may seem a long way away to you. It's not. It's only one of the days after the month. The time which you will spend on this campus, between now and then, will very likely be the most important time of your life. For most of you, it won't be easy. It will be happy, but not always. It will be sad and troubled, but not always. It will be a time of change and maturity. It will be a time of preparation for what comes later. And who knows? You may even discover what kind of person you really are during that time. Now, during the days ahead, you'll need to learn a great many more things than you know at present. This is serious business, as you will learn when examination time comes. Most of you are going to need some help in this learning process. Your professors will help you, 
Those are the ideas, facts, figures. They may even pique your curiosity enough to make you want to learn a few things on your own. Your friends will help you, your faculty advisors, your curricular advisors, and others with whom you associate. But these sources are limited. They are limited primarily because there are so many of you and so few of them. But the one source which is almost limitless is the library. Your library card is your passport to learning unlimited. I want to tell you a few things about your college library which I think you should know. Of course, I don't expect you to remember them after you leave this auditorium. But you should gain the impression that the library to which all of you have access is a rather impressive source of information. Our library is more than a collection of books what we like to call a material center. It contains almost every type of material which has been devised to assist in learning. We have these materials in both quantity and quality. There are over 260,000 books in the library. That's over a quarter of a million. Year after next, at this time, there will be over 300,000 volumes in the collection. And by the time some of you come back to do graduate study, there'll be half a million volumes. We receive close to 1,700 current periodicals, 24 newspapers, our library owns over 850 16 millimeter films, educational films. And we rent in over 200 films per month from other sources for our faculty members to use with their students. We have over 3,000 educational film scripts over 2,700 instructional disc recordings, and over 900 tape recordings. Some of you are going to be concerned later with textbooks and courses of study for curriculum building on the elementary and secondary level. There are over 10,000 textbooks and more than 4,200 courses of study in our library for the use of students who are preparing to teach. And there are thousands of other materials, such as slides, pictures, models, educational games and toys, etc. Now these materials are used by our students and faculty. Last year, 1963-64, over 335,000 books were circulated. During the same period, more than 245,000 periodicals were used. There were over 15,000 film showings on campus last year. That's an average of approximately 1,250 per month. Other materials used, such as film strips, slides, recordings, pictures, etc. totaled over 57,000. In round numbers, this adds up to a total of 652,000 library items used in one year. Now, if education and the massive accumulation of learning isn't resulting from this use, there's a whale of a lot of activity going on unnecessarily. All of these materials are here for only one purpose, 
to provide you with information. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, you have to do something about it. You can go in the book stack and you can stand there surrounded by all of the knowledge and recorded wisdom of the ages. You simply cannot hope for its miraculous transfer to your mind. One of the grim facts of life is that there is no osmotic action between people and books unless the people read the book. Now, in order to use the library materials intelligently, you've, you've got to know how to use the library. You've got to know what you want. You can learn to help yourself a great deal. We're going to do that this afternoon if you listen closely to what this channel has to say. The library handbook can help you. That's what it looks like. If you don't have one, get one and read it. And there are a number of professionally trained librarians in the library. They're there to help you. If you've tried to fail to locate necessary information or material, don't hesitate. To ask the professional librarian on duty in the room to help you. They positively will not bite you. Unless you bite them first. Now, some of the faculty sneak around and ask the student assistant. But don't you do that because you're likely to get the wrong information. But before you ask for help, <clears throat> try to determine as accurately as possible exactly what it is that you want. Don't be like the freshman whose professor told him to go to the library and read the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. When he went to the library a few days later, he tried to find the book. He looked in the card catalog, couldn't find it, listed anywhere. Finally went to the librarian and said, couldn't find the book his professor had told him to read. Library asked, the librarian asked him uh, whether he knew the author and title of the book. He said, well, I didn't write it down, but I'm pretty sure it was the red ship of the Omar man. I want to welcome you to the library personally and on behalf of the library staff. We hope you will come to the this is the library just as often as you need to. But please don't all of you try to come at the same time. Until we can add to our present building, our space is going to be exceedingly limited. Well, good luck. God see. Thank you, Dr. Grady. We're experimenting with uh, microphones today to make this presentation. Our idea is to raise uh, among us here a few questions that we think you might be asking. In fact, some of them were solicited from freshmen, and some of them we think that you ought to be asking. I'd like to introduce the panel. Uh, going to the far left, Dr. Donald McBain, who is a professor of library science and assistant librarian. And director of Reader Services. Next to him is Miss Carolyn Light, who is a, a senior and honors student, a major in elementary education. If you fellows want any more information about her, you're going to have to get it on your own. Next to her is Dr. Uh, Robert Tyler, who's Associate Professor of Social Science. And coming this way again is Mr. Neil Coyle, who is uh, Assistant uh, Professor of Library Science and Reference Librarian. Some of you probably have seen him already if you've been in trying to get help. And then finally, uh, Mr. Dwayne Beal, who's Assistant Professor of uh, Mathematics. I see a young lady smiling back there, Mr. Beal, and she must be in your class or something. You may ask the question, well, why did we uh, bring these two particular professors here, Mr. Beal and Dr. Tyler, 
and uh, I'm assured that they are professors who make sure their students get into the library, and that's, that's why they're here. Let's, uh, let's start the questions with the easy one. Uh, what we hope to do is ask a uh, kind of question that will give you information about the library, but also kind of questions that might help you develop a sensitivity or an attitude toward the use of the library and its significance in your education. I'll be testing these questions as if I were the freshman involved. If I don't now have a library card, what do I do to get one? Which of the librarians can tell us about that? Dr. McVeigh? Well, if you have, uh, if you do not have your library card, all you need to do is uh, take your ID card and go to the loan desk in the west wing of the library and they'll issue your library card. Of course, most of you should have received your card through the mail prior to the beginning of the school, but if that is not the case, you can get one by the method I just described. Another thing, Dean Lawhead, I think it's very important for all of you to remember to carry your library card and your ID card with you at all times. Uh, there might be a time when you uh, think you might not need your library card or you don't think you're going to the library. But if you have a few minutes, you might uh, decide to stop in and get that book or that magazine if you had needed. So uh, when you find yourself there without your card, so try and keep them with you at all times. I think it'll be real valuable. This is good advice from a good student. Uh, next question, having a library card, uh, how do I get a book out of the library? Mr. Coyle, you want to? Well, we'll assume, first of all, that the uh, person who's been to the card catalog has obtained the bibliographic information that he needs, that he has gone to the SAC directory in the SAC, that he's found the book or books that he wants, and he's brought them back to the loan service counter, which I hope you've seen by now. You present the book, your ID card, and the library card to the student attendant at the loan service counter, and a machine record will be made which will record the fact that you have borrowed particular books on a particular date and they'll be due on a certain date. The key thing is, of course, to know what books you want, and we'll talk about that a little later, and have that library card, that ID card, so the transaction may be completed. I stress the importance of the library card and ID card because our charging system is a machine charging system. Don't make handwritten charges. Your card has a little metal tab on it, which uh, is recorded in that machine. Thank you. Suppose the library book is out. What uh, what recourse does the student have uh, who wants the book? Dean Lawhead, uh, an open stack library, and one which is heavily used as ours is. Student will find uh, on many occasions that the particular material that he wants at that moment is not available. He should feel free to stop at the loan service counter and have a search made in the circulation well to determine where the book might be. Now, the people at the circulation counter will need the call number for that book. If the book is in circulation, they will so inform you. They will tell you when the book is due. They will not tell you who has the book. They will tell you when the book is due. If you desire it, you may have your name placed on a little flag for that book. When the book's returned, then it's your turn to have it. Now, if a faculty person has the book, he, of course, will be entitled to it longer than uh, the usual two-week period. You may indicate that you wish to have the book recalled for your use. Of course, if the book's on reserve, it's another matter entirely, and you'll be referred to the reserve book number for that particular book. I think these questions are very helpful. They're the very specialized and particular kind that you want answered. Uh, I think we'd be remiss, though, if we did not uh, try to raise some questions here about your relationship <coughs> to the library. When I came in uh, a while ago, I uh, was with a student and uh, was also with Dr. Tyler here, and uh, there was an exchange of, of greetings, and uh, to me, the student said, this man is a real motivator when it comes to reading. 
uh, I didn't have time in the press of, of uh, walking along to uh, inquire into this, but I suspect that uh, uh, the student had in mind particular qualities uh, in Dr. Tyler and his work with students that I think it'd be interesting to get his reaction to the question, uh, how do you see the library in the academic life of the student? Uh, if you were a student again, how would you look upon the library as a resource? Would you like to react generally to that kind of question? <clears throat> I should mention that this student that you heard me talking to was, was a graduate student having a freshman. That might have made some sense. Yeah. You weren't supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I bring this up because, uh, as you all know, being freshmen, much of your classwork is tied to a textbook. Uh, you study 10 pages this week or two chapters for two weeks and some outside reading paperbacks perhaps and you might get the impression uh, that this is how you study some uh, the material in some discipline such as history or mathematics but uh, there's another way in which you can uh, help yourself out considerably I think even as freshmen as a for instance uh, suppose you're in a history class uh, and the professor is talking about uh, Christopher Columbus, as they usually do at the beginning of American history. And the assignment in the textbook is dealing with Christopher Columbus also. Uh, one, way, one way in which you could help yourself out considerably on tests and practically would be to spend half hour in the library sometime when you have the time. Uh, you'd be surprised how much uh, supplementary in information you might be able to pick up by using the library wisely, just the card catalog even. Well, you might find out who the uh, established uh, biographers of Christopher Columbus are. And you might go into the stash without even checking out any books and sample some prefaces, or take a sample of a chapter of one of these books. Uh, and with a half hour investment of your time, you might find yourself uh, finding out an awful lot of things which would be very useful to you. And another thing to remember, I think, which you will find, I think, later as you get into upper division classes, is that your uh, education will become less and less textbook centered, too. And it might pay you to, as a freshman, to get used to using the library in this way. Thank yeah. you. I didn't encounter any of uh, Mr. Deal's students uh, out there, but uh, I think he wants to react to this. Well, they were all over the library. Yes. No. Uh, I, I agree with Dr. Tyler implicitly that the uh, education that you get out of college is not really what you get out of the classroom. The education that you're going to have is the uh, idea of learning to learn, as Dean Law had mentioned a while ago. And while you can get much of this out of the classroom, the things that are in the library are perhaps in the long run even more important. There's a lot in the library. Some of it is true and a lot of it isn't true. And we need to learn about the fact that there are things like this exist, that there are lots of things that uh, perhaps uh, we don't agree with, and we need to react toward them negatively and positively. Uh, there's things like this that make, the, uh, that make one's education really stand out. You go out into the cold, cruel world, and if you consider at the time you graduate from college that you are educated, then you are not correct. You are just beginning to become educated as you graduate. The use of the library while you're in college leads to the use of the library after you're out of college, and this is perhaps one of the most important things that you can get out of your education. Thank you. There's been a great deal of reference to wise use of the library and the effective use of the library and the expression the card catalog has been used. Uh, I wonder if we might have a slide that's been prepared and uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Coyle to react to just some questions about the using of, of this catalog card that uh, some of you may know about, others perhaps not. Could we have the light down, please? And Thank you, Dean Lawhead. Young people, the single most important bibliographic tool in that library is the card catalog. It's almost the, uh, I might say, the single most uh, important intimidating factor student use of the library. Most students are frightened of that card catalog. You shouldn't be. 
You've seen these things before in your high school library and your public library. And what we have for you over here is somewhat similar, except on perhaps a grander scale. Now let's just run through a sample set of catalog cards for a book. This is the main or author card. And let's see what some of these things mean and how we may put them to use. First of all, letter A, the call number. Now, this library used to the Dewey Decimal System, and that 395 happens to be the Dewey class number for the particular book on uh, manners and etiquette. The lower number, A425I2, is what we call a cutter number. That's a piece of library jargon that you need not particularly remember at this moment. The important thing here is that you copy every single thing that you see that looks like a call number, and that includes any special sign or symbol associated with that book on that catalog card. And if you take a look at a particular area above our card catalog in the library, you will see that we have a large sign which lists and explains the special signs and symbols associated with that catalog. CJ, for example, is a special sign or symbol. That means it's in the uh, college juvenile collection, and that's in a particular place in the library. And by referring to that and to the certain stack directory that we have, you'll be able to locate the particular area of the library to which you want to go. Let me say again, you want to be certain that you copy everything which belongs to the call number for the book. Item B is the author's name with the last name first, of course. Make it easier to file, actually. Followed by the author's birth date. Item C is the birth date. Item B is the title, if you please. And then item E is the subtitle of Book of Manners for Young Readers. Item F adds additional information about the book. In this instance, there is a joint author, Mitchell Pyrie Briggs, and it's illustrated by Charles Malcolm Allen. This is a revised edition, published in Chicago by Lippincott, copyright date 1950. Now, I'm not taking these entries in any particular alphabetical order now. I'm just going to work right down to the bottom of the card. Uh, entry L describes that book physically and tells me something about its content. The small Roman figures indicate that there are 21 pages of preparatory material, probably the author's preface, something like that. There are 237 pages in the book. The book is illustrated. I know that because the little abbreviation I-L-L-U-S indicates so. And then finally, uh, something about the size of that book is also uh, served to me. Ordinarily, that will not concern you. That might be uh, for our purposes in case we were trying to search for a book which was lost. And we'd have to know, uh, for example, how, approximately how big the book was, 20 centimeters high. But then uh, there's a further description of the book. Bibliography, pages 229 to 232. And this can be very helpful because it leads me through this book to locate other books on a similar topic. And then finally there at the bottom of the card, uh, some added entries called in library jargon once again, tracing. This indicates to me that under the subject heading etiquette for children and youth, I will find uh, a card for this book, subject card. Under the subject heading youth, I will find a card for this book. And uh, under the name of the joint author, I'll find a card for the book, and I'll also find a title entry for this book. So I can approach the book in three ways then, by author, by subject, and by title. Now, Ms. Brady described for you a mass of information uh, which we have for you over here. For every catalog item that we have in our library, you will find, in most cases, at least three cards and probably more, author, subject, and title entry. Now, so far as periodicals are concerned, uh, the situation is a little bit different here. What we're showing you now is a sample entry from the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature. Now, once you learn to handle any one of these several periodical indexes, 
you will be uh, on safe ground because they all work pretty much alike. Now, they don't all index the same kind of periodicals, but the interior format uh, is the same. For example, here is an entry from the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature. The subject heading under which this entry appears is Artificial Satellite. That's the title of, uh, that's the subject heading. The title of the article is Amateur Scientist, How to Study Artificial Satellites Without Complex Equipment. The authors are R.H. Loveberg and L.C. Burkhart. This article is illustrated. The abbreviation I.L. tells me that. The article appeared in Scientific American, volume 198. The article was on pages 98 to 100, and it appeared in the January 1958 issue of that magazine. Now, the next question that occurs to me is, does the library own Scientific American? I'll assume now that we're working in the periodical reading room. Your next step, after a copying, citation, many of the periodical indexes, would be to go to the line deck, L-I-N-E-D-E-X, the line deck, which occupies a very prominent place uh, in the front desk of the periodical reading room. You can check that line deck under the entry Scientific American, and you can tell exactly what our holdings are of that particular periodical. Now, we have, in addition to the Reader's Guide, the International Index, the Applied Science and Technology Index, the Business Periodicals Index, the Art Index, the Education Index, the Agricultural Index, and so on and so on and so on. as a specialized index for every subject matter area, and we will help you to get into the right one. I think, being law ahead, that that will pretty well uh, conclude what I want to say about the uh, uh, samples from the catalog and the index. Thank you. Suppose I have a roommate who uh, isn't as interested in scholarship and books as much as I am, the ones to study, and I can't study in my room, uh, where can I study in the library? Uh, maybe I ought to ask Miss Light this, where have you found uh, a good place to study in the library? Uh, I think probably most of the time I've spent in the reserve room. This is a room that's in, I don't know how to tell you, it's the new section of the library. As you're looking at the front, it's on the left side, and it's a room in the, on the first floor. And uh, it's just full of tables. It's where you can find reserve books that your professors have put on reserve. And I think a lot of times uh, the uh, students do go there to check out a book. But there are also times when, as Dean Law has said, they'll want to study. And this is a uh, pretty fine place, except I know it does get um, busy in the evening. A lot of people do study there. And sometimes you find yourself looking up to see who's coming in with you and all that. So. Um, one of the little tricks that I found is that, uh, for one thing, sit not facing the door <laughs> if possible. And also in some of the rooms, uh, especially in that room, there are single desks along the wall. And if you really want to do some concentrated study, uh, this is a real fine place because there isn't anyone else around you. And there, uh, you can study in uh, the periodical room. There are um, tables up there. But uh, in all of these rooms, there is also uh, besides just study, some other type of business going on, like the checking out of books and checking out of periodicals. So you will find uh, some noise, but uh, this you need to keep down to a minimum if you are one of these that's using uh, this particular room for uh, the use that it was originally intended. And also, if you wish, if you are there with someone that you know, and maybe you don't really want to study, and uh, but you feel like you have to, and there are times when you want to get up and go drink of water or something that you're talking. And uh, the noise that you have in conversing back and forth should be done outside of the room because it's a real bother that someone who really wants to study. I take from your remarks that uh, other things go on in the library other than studying and reading a book, and you're cautioning us to uh, not to do that by feeding ourselves to look at the wall instead of just passing by. Uh, I would guess that the librarians wouldn't take the point of view that the library is, is a place to always be silent and, and we regard the place as the final resting place of the dearly departed dead. But uh, I, I'm sure they don't take that view, but I wonder if one of the librarians could react to their point of view toward this matter of how much uh, uh, sociability uh, is appropriate for the library. Did either one of you gentlemen want to react to that? Oh, um, 
You know, there's a serious problem in the library due to our present crowded condition. Of course, our belief is that excessive talking is completely out of keeping with the studio's atmosphere. So we uh, request, of course, that uh, only essential talking is done, that we want to visit with your friends, so on, that uh, you go to the student center or some other place for that. Because uh, noise is a very disturbing factor. Uh, one question that concerns me is uh, an impression I get when I when I came to Ball State. I had uh, close contact with four other colleges and universities, and in none of them was I able to uh, go back and through the shelves as an undergraduate and get a book. I had to, uh, as you say, Mr. Hoyle, uh, look in the card catalog and fill out a little slip, and uh, they never trusted uh, any of us to go back into the stack. You've used the term open stacks here and closed stacks. Uh, would either of you want to comment, or even, even the instructors who are here, uh, want to comment about uh, the responsibilities and really the opportunities of a library like this one that has open staff? It's wide open for anything. Well, I'll jump in first then. Um, first of all, uh, let me say that. Uh, as I said before, this is an open stack library. This means that you have the privilege of one identifying yourself properly, of going into the stacks and uh, going to any stack level that you want to go to. If you have the privilege of browsing, rubbing shoulders with books, uh, just seeing what's there. And this is a rare opportunity. Most book collections that are approaching our size are now closed stack collections. That is, you have to fill out some kind of slip and someone pays the book for you. Well, you still have an opportunity to take advantage of what's becoming a rare situation. I hope you'll do it. Uh, this is uh, a fascinating kind of place just to go to look around and see what's there. And it's sometimes uh, almost as valuable as uh, an hour spent in a lecture hall. I'm sure some of the other gentlemen and the uh, lady too will have uh, some observations on this point. Another comment? Uh, this has some responsibilities attached to it too. For example, this morning I found a uh, 365 books in the 800 stack, <laughs> which uh, means that if you take a book out to look at it when you're browsing, either be, I guess I shouldn't say this, either be very careful and put it back in exactly the same place you took it out, or no, you're even better yet, <laughs> even better yet, put it on the table in the end and let the librarian put it back. Because a book is effectively lost for everybody if it's, uh, it's as good as a lost book if it's in uh, Place where it isn't supposed to be. We have just another minute. Uh, I wonder if there's any final observation that uh, anyone on this panel would like to make relative to the scope of, of this convocation. Any final words? I'd like to make, make say one quick sentence here. Uh, this concerns with how much help we're prepared to give you. If you come to the library looking for a specific fact or date, with the population much in Delaware County, we'll help you find that in the most expeditious manner. If you come to the library to write a term paper on uh, the symbolism of Faulkner, we are going to show you a number of specialized bibliographies and indexes. The theory is that we're carrying on a teaching function. We'll lead you up to the point where you can amass the information for yourself, and then you're on your own. But we'll help you that far. Yes. I think I'd like to add just my own personal plug for this handbook that uh, Dr. Grady mentioned before. Uh, I know a lot of times freshmen, particularly freshmen, are given so much material that they just, you know, stuck in the desk and don't really look at it. But uh, there, it's just a wealth of information. If there is something that you're looking for, you might be a little bit uh, better educated to go to the library if, if you want to look through here and see if you can find some further information besides what you've just gotten today. And then if you still can't, find what you're looking for, be sure and ask someone. Thank you. This is available free by going to the information desk in the administration building. If you have not picked one up, please do so. I'd like to say thank you for your attention today. I feel that the uh, dealing of these questions of this panel has been important to you. We've heard all of it. Uh, in the way of an announcement, I'd like to announce the final convocation in this series a week from tomorrow at 2 o'clock.
At that time, uh, Vice President Burkhardt, who is Dean of Faculty and Vice President for Instruction, will speak on the topic, The Challenge of Ideas. Here's an opportunity to hear the academic leader of the college express what he sees as a, a goal of a college education and something of the inspiration and uh, expectation uh, for you in a, in a college education. Thank you very much. Good journey. Mm -hmm.